Uh, I'm Jeff Bluegrass, Executive Director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston, and on behalf of the Rappaport Institute and the Talbot Center for State and Local Government, we have this discussion about uh, the ambitious plans that have been put forward to for Boston's Convention Center. Thank you for coming. There is a sign up sheet going around. Um, if you want to be informed of other uh, upcoming events, uh, I would uh, commend you to that. Uh, let me highlight uh, three coming up in the next uh, week and a half. Tomorrow uh, at 4.30, uh, and this has been scheduled on fairly short notice now, um, Jay Walder, who is about to step down as the head of New York's Metropolitan Transportation Authority um, to take uh, a job running transit in Hong Kong, will come talk about the challenges of public transit. Many of you know Jay, and I'm sure will concur with you that he is always uh, an interesting, thoughtful, provocative, and entertaining speaker. That'll be at 4.30 tomorrow in Bell Hall, top floor of the other building. If you found this room, you can find any of them. Um, the following Wednesday, uh, again, also uh, just confirm, um, the Taubman Center and uh, the Rapport Institute are co-sponsoring an event on, well, can we measure the quality of urban governance? Aaron Yellowitz, who's a professor of economics at the University of Kentucky, who has been developing a pilot project for the Manhattan Institute uh, on whether we could actually come up with some apples-to-apples you know, -apples metrics to compare the quality of basic uh, public services in a variety of places. Uh, we'll be talking about that project with commentary by Stephanie Hirsch, uh, former director of the Somerset uh, Performance Management Program in Somerville, which is, as you know, is the leading, really one of the leading performance management programs, certainly in the region and probably in the country. And then finally on Friday, uh, October 21st, there is an all-day symposium at Radcliffe, uh, co-sponsored by the Rappaport Institute, City of Boston, and Radcliffe on reimagining the city-university connection. It's a terrific day. With people from Harvard, people from the city, people from other universities, both in Boston and elsewhere, talking about uh, what would it take and how does one go about building serious partnerships that involve both public policy and um, serious academic research, particularly in social sciences. Uh, you can find information about that online at the Rappaport website. And I'm thrilled uh, to turn things over to tonight's moderator, my, my good friend and mentor, Alan Altschuler. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, you want me to stay near the mic because we are recording, so I will do that and I will stay seated. Uh, we live in an age of cutbacks. Everything, every time we pick up the newspaper, we're hearing about uh, how government programs are going to be cut back. But uh, we have a uh, proposal working its way through the system. We don't know where it's, it's going to come out for a time, but working its way through the system for uh, $2 billion worth of investment to uh, expand the uh, convention center in Boston and the hotel. And so on a mix of public and private money, but a lot of public money uh, in there. And uh, it's going to be very exciting to hear uh, not just the pro side, but also uh, uh, some of the negatives. Uh, there was a 27 member commission that, or committee that uh, took a look at this on behalf of the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority uh, uh, from 2009 to 2011, is that right? And uh, 24 of the 27 members recommended the program that the Jim is going to tell you about, and one of the other three was our other speaker, Mike Lidner, uh, this evening. Uh, Jim Rooney has, since 2003, served as executive director of the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority, which we will henceforth refer to as MCCA, um, in which capacity he oversees not just uh, the South Boston Convention Center, but the Heinz Convention Center, the Boston Common Parking Garage, and the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield, which includes a, uh, I didn't know this until today when I was reading about this, a 6,700-seat arena uh, plus uh, a meeting space, their own convention. Previously, from 2001 to 2003, Jim oversaw uh, both construction of the New Boston Convention Center and uh, the renovation and expansion of the Mass Mutual Center, together more than $900 million uh, in those projects. Both were completed uh, on schedule and on budget. 
uh, are under budget and uh, within budget. Uh, accomplishments uh, which Jim has uh, very deservedly received a lot of uh, a great deal of credit. Uh, before moving to the Convention Center Authority in 2003, well, 2001 to construct it, 2003 in his current position, uh, Jim spent 23 years in, uh, as a transportation official in Massachusetts. Uh, most of that time at the MBTA, where he rose to become Deputy General Manager, uh, also senior positions at the Turnpike Authority and the Central Artery Project. He then spent two years as Chief of Staff to Tom Menino, uh, as Mayor of Boston, and uh, then, of course, came into his current role uh, as a Convention Center Executive. Uh, Jim is a graduate of the Boston Latin School and Harvard College, where he majored in economics and attended Harvard at BU uh, School of Management. Mike Widmer, who will comment, I'll introduce them both up front, uh, has been president of the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation since 1992. He joined the foundation in 1990 uh, after more than 20 years uh, of management in both the public and the private sectors uh, of Massachusetts. In particular, uh, Mike served in the 1970s as Special Assistant to the Secretary of Human Services in both the Sargent and the Dukakis administration. Not many people who held the political appointments managed to make that transition uh, between those two administrations, but Mike did. And also uh, became then Dukakis' uh, Director of Communications and Deputy Chief Secretary. Uh, then from 1979 to 1990, he moved to the private sector where he worked for the Cabot Corporation, first as Director of Public Affairs, later as Vice President for Human Resources. Uh, Mike received his BA from Princeton, then an MA and PhD in political science in government uh, from Harvard, uh, where he specialized in Soviet studies. And we were talking earlier about whether that was good background for dealing in Massachusetts politics. <laughs> uh, anyway, let me turn it over to Jim for the uh, uh, I'm going to stand up uh, and talk because I want to use this uh, I want to use the screen uh, behind me um, and just uh, by way of an introduction, uh, thank David and thank Alan for the opportunity to come over and talk about this. In some ways, just the fact that the old subject of meetings and conventions has found its way into this forum uh, is significant um, in and of itself. Um, this is... Uh, this is a, a subject that I'm going to ask you to put on um, a different set of, I guess, um, uh, lenses. Uh, and think about this in terms of a long-term business plan, because really that's what it is. And some of what we're dealing with um, today is trying to process that um, through a set of public sector short-term kind of uh, thinking processes that don't lend itself to that kind of thing. Um, convention centers in large hotel development take a long time to do, and just by way of example, um, the current convention center in South Boston, the VCEC, uh, was in the stage that we're in now in the early 90s. People were talking about it, thinking about it, making proposals about what could be done. Uh, the legislation that ultimately passed to create the new convention center uh, ultimately got done in 1997. I hope we're not talking about this for seven more years. Uh, and then the doors to the convention center opened in 2004. So it was roughly a 12 to 14 year process um, to get the existing convention center uh, actually built. So when we um, talk about the need to think about expanding this convention center, it is with the full knowledge that these kinds of things take time to process. Uh, if someone told me today that we could go forward with the ambitious program that we're, we've laid out, um, there's no way that we could get any of it done within five years, five to seven years on the most ambitious schedule. But it's more likely to be something that is five to 15 or even 20 years long in terms of implementation of this project. Um, and the reason we're talking about it, as you'll see in the presentation, is because in many ways, as an organization, as a business, we're in a what-do-we-do-now moment. Um, we've achieved many of the business, political, economic development objectives that were set forward for us uh, when we started on this journey with the new convention center and, 
and moving Boston into the top echelon of international convention cities. Um, and we did that much quick, more quickly than anyone thought we would. So uh, we're in, as an organization, we're, we're at this what do we do now moment. So this is an attempt to begin to answer that question. I have a whole slide presentation, um, but we also have a short video that I think give you a sense of what this big project is all about uh, that I'd like to show. It's, uh, I think, about five minutes long. Um, it's actually not finished yet, so you, if you pay keen attention, you'll notice some, some, uh, some errors in it, but that's okay. It still, I think, uh, serves the purpose. So can we uh, do that real quick, and then I'll come back. I don't know if we can block that sign at all. When a new convention center was first considered in Boston, there were plenty of skeptics who questioned its cost and its worth. They called it the next big dig. They said it wouldn't work. While years later, the skeptics were wrong. Completed on time and on budget, the BCEC radically transformed 60 acres on South Boston's waterfront into a driving component of the region's economy generating $3.5 billion in economic impact and elevating Boston into the top 10 meeting and convention destinations in North America. Building on this success, we propose an expansion plan that will elevate Boston into the top five convention destinations on the continent, creating thousands of more jobs, growing Boston's hospitality sector, and generating billions more in economic benefits. Our vision of the future means beginning projects today that will support our city for generations to come. We've learned that the BCEC is more than a gathering place for meetings and events. In our buildings, decision makers and industry leaders from across the globe come not only to experience our hospitality, but to do business face to face, making Massachusetts one of the smartest places to shake hands. This is extremely important to the local Boston game development community. It's uh, an important moment for business deals to get done because publishers come over to check out the latest games uh, from different developers. And it gives us the chance to uh, meet other developers who just happen to be in town either to work and show or to attend just for fun. And they come and see all the great work that's being done in Boston. And they can start to see Boston as a place where they want to live and work themselves. This push for the top five is being driven by a diverse group of stakeholders called the Convention Partnership. Appointed by Governor Patrick, Mayor Menino, Senate President Murray, and Speaker of the House DeLeo, the goal of this group is to objectively study the convention industry as it relates to the Commonwealth. So the three key aspects that will help Boston vault itself into the top five destinations in North America are hotel development in the waterfront area, a multi-purpose room, as well as uh, an expanded exhibit hall. Events at the BCEC can demand as many as 7,000 hotel rooms, yet we have only 1,700 rooms within walking distance. This can require events to spend up to $1 million just to bus attendees from area hotels to the convention center, a cost they don't incur in other cities and a major competitive disadvantage for Boston. This lack of nearby hotel rooms and additional exhibit space means we lose business every year. Over the last four and a half years, we've lost the opportunity to host events that represent $630 million in potential economic impact and $39 million in tax benefits. We love Boston. We've had our most successful events here in Boston. Many of our biotech member companies have their businesses here. We'd like to come back to Boston on a more regular basis, and we need expansion and hotel room, more hotel rooms to do that. I think in order for Boston to compete for not only our business, but other convention business, um, some of the cities that are pursuing us have more space, have more hotel rooms, so we need that expansion in the hotel room for us. A new hotel near the BCEC is the first and most critical step of our future success. Shaving transportation costs and keeping our guests in the area will support not only the events at the convention center, but local small businesses as well. When we have a convention come to town, uh, we prepare as best we can. We staff up. We'll sometimes double, triple the staff, specifically on weekdays. Uh, we'll take a lunch and, and probably triple the sales and order all the extra product. And, uh, it, it's, 
it's a good day. A new, larger, multi-purpose space and an expansion of the exhibit hall are the next steps to help us remain competitive for future convention opportunities, allowing us to book simultaneous and larger events that we currently can't accommodate. When the convention center was being built, I was on site for about a year, along with a hundred iron workers. It was a great project and created a lot of jobs. We're out here now working on a much smaller project and with how difficult things are right now to get work, it would be a great opportunity to work on a potential expansion of the convention center in a possible hotel. It would be great for jobs in the economy. The, the convention partnership is really a true collaborative effort with the community, with elected public officials, with other parts of the hospitality industry, but it goes beyond that. It also promotes connections with industries and companies who in effect also can expand their business and expand job creation within our region and within our state. It's not just about building a bigger convention center. It's about supporting our core industries and attracting new business as we make Boston and the Commonwealth beacons in this new 21st century knowledge-based economy. Top 5 isn't just about growing our convention business. Top 5 is about our future. So that's a um, little promotional video we put together. And the two mistakes that are still in it that I'll point out, if you noticed on the Massachusetts map, there was a star that was put in to indicate where Boston is. And I think right now it's somewhere around Plymouth. <laughs> and then um, the other is we have Paul Guzzi working for the city of Boston. Um, and I think there's one or two others in there too. So I'm going to walk through a quick um, presentation and then, um, and then we'll get on to some Q&A. Um, I want to start with why um, meetings matter. Uh, and for, by le leading off by saying that during this presentation I'm going to give you a lot of data and I'm going to give you a lot of numbers, uh, mostly based in uh, economic impact and tourism industry metrics uh, that will demonstrate to you that Boston is already and has a leading uh, host of meetings, particularly as it relates to international meetings. In fact, that there's, there's an organization based in Brussels, International Convention Center Association, that every year ranks countries and cities in terms of hosting true international meetings, which means meetings that can't be in the same country two years in a row. Uh, and I, I think to no one's surprise, the United States is the leader in hosting the most true international meetings, but I think to a lot of people's surprise, Boston is the number one city in the United States for hosting true international meetings. Overall in the world, we're in 45th place with Paris and Indiana uh, being uh, numbers one and two. So I'm going to give you a lot of data about uh, Boston in the convention and meetings industry. I will tell you that it is a $907 billion industry in the United States. People sometimes don't think about conventions and meetings as being that big. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that the hus broader hospitality and tourism industry that we're a part of is the largest industry in the world, the second biggest industry in the United States, and the third biggest industry in Massachusetts. Uh, and if you look at employment data in terms of what is fueling some of the recovery here in Massachusetts, you'll find that one of the leading drivers of that recovery is the hospitality and tourism industry. So we're going to talk about that and where Boston is poised to go. Uh, I'm going to tell you the conventions and meetings are about commerce and information. Um, you'll hear a lot of people, particularly people that don't think this is such a good idea, want to talk about one thing, hotel room nights. And I'm here to tell you that that's measuring the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there isn't a meeting planner on the planet that's sitting back saying, let's have a biotechnology conference, let's have a video gaming conference, let's have a conference in Boston or San Francisco or Chicago so we can put people in hotels. That's not what meetings are about. Meetings are about convention information transfer and knowledge transfer. And when we measure just these tourism metrics, despite the fact that we're very good at that, we're only tapping into the tip of the iceberg. So I want to talk about that. Uh, I want to talk about the fact that conventions and meetings can be a key component of a short-term job creation strategy as well as a long-term economic development strategy. And I'll show you some numbers in terms of what it would mean if we did begin to spend this much money on the economy. And lastly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, although I could. Um, I do want to <coughs> make the point that Boston needs to embrace itself uh, 
the greatest sense of itself as an international city. Um, recently, I've heard the mayor give a couple of speeches about Boston in a recent ranking um, that uh, uh, says that Boston is the sixth leading city in the world for um, international financial commerce, which is a great ranking. If you look at any of the rankings that, that look at what will be the globally significant destinations on the planet over the next 25 or 50 years. Many times Boston is mentioned, and the question is, are we embracing that role as a leading city in the new international knowledge-based economy? And what role does hosting key meetings and conventions play in that beyond the simple notion of just measuring how many people stayed at the health internet? Um, so um, that's why we think meetings matter. I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of this, and I guess I'm going to do this for myself. Um, so we've talked about top five. Uh, what does top five mean? Um, so let me give you some context for this. Uh, we built and opened the BCEC back in 2004, as I said. By 2006, we were ranked in the top 10. This is a market share ranking. Uh, so we've been seven, eight, nine each year since 2006, and uh, for 2010, uh, we're currently ranked eighth in terms of market share in the convention industry. And the cities ahead of us, you wouldn't be surprised at all. By way of background, um, why did we get into this business and why did everybody else get into it? Uh, in the 80s and 90s, it was one of the fastest growing industries in the country. I won't go through all these metrics, but you know how to read a graph, and when the graph has all the lines going in that direction with that kind of growth, uh, that means something's going on. What was going on is the high-tech industry was driving a huge growth in meetings and conventions, and some of you might remember the days of Apple and Macworld back in Boston when they would just go <coughs> over the city and people were walking around with those little bags. Those meetings were going crazy and cities all over the United States were desperate to get into this business um, and we were building or expanding convention centers. We chose to do it on 62 acres of underutilized land on the waterfront with a goal of achieving performance, greater performance for Boston and Massachusetts in those traditional tourism metrics, getting more people into our hotels getting more people eating in restaurants and shops. Um, so uh, what did we do? We spent $850 million on a public project. We built the largest building that's ever been built in New England, and we did it on time and within the budget that was allocated for us. We did it 100% funded from within the travel and tourism industry. So this is mostly hotel taxes uh, that are paid for. Uh, by people generally who visit Boston and Massachusetts. We didn't take any money from income taxes, business taxes, property taxes, or gas taxes. So you'll hear a lot of conversation about false choices between other uses of, of these monies. Um, but we didn't use any of that money. We used all visitor industry money to pay for the convention center on an operating basis. Um, many of you know that convention centers are lost leaders, so generally we within our operating budget lose money. So the state has authorized us to spend a certain amount of money that we draw down from the Commonwealth. Um, one of the ways we measure our success uh, is, what, is how much we generate in taxes versus how much we draw down. So there's three simple numbers to remember. The operations of the MCCA since 2000, fiscal 2005 to 11 generated, sent up to the Commonwealth $194 million. The legislature authorized us in, in operating assistance $161 million. On an operating basis, we only drew 136 of 161 we were authorized to draw. So we actually left some money on the table. And beyond that, if that's not enough for you, um, a convention center fund, which is set up to pay the debt service and the operating costs, actually sent $80 million from the convention center fund over to the general fund to help bail out the Commonwealth. 65 million of that money <coughs> was sent over in 2009 uh, when the Commonwealth was trying to balance its budget. So for all of that, starting with the $850 million investment, looking a 10-year 10, 10 sort of look forward from when the BCEC first opened through fiscal year 2014, here's what we got back. And this, by the way, is a set of statistics that we had audited by an independent group. Because anytime you put numbers out, this, out there like this, and if you're a public sector guy in particular, 
they get questioned. Some people go as far as to say whenever they see these numbers, they'll cut them in half uh, just because public sector guys tend to exaggerate. Uh, we had these audited uh, by an independent group. The MCCA board asked uh, that we do that. Uh, so that's public information as well. 5.2 billion in economic impact. I won't read all of these. Uh, 2,400 meetings that will host 431 of those meetings will have a thousand hotel room nights uh, on peak. That's in one single night. One of my favorites up there in terms of demonstrating economic impact um, that could only have happened in Boston because the meeting was in Boston is there'll be about a million taxi trips um, taken from the convention center. Now, if you just do some simple math at 30 bucks per taxi trip, that's a whole heck of a lot of money for people that are driving taxis. And those taxi trips would have taken place in Chicago or San Francisco or someplace else, not someplace, not another part of Boston or another part of the country. So, and, and we're sustaining 5,400 jobs uh, by being in business. So that's what we got for in the first 10 years for our $850 million investment. Um, I show this slide. This is just a graphic year by year representation of some of the me some of the things we measure. Hotel room nights, you can see, are uh, hovering in that 500,000 um, to 600,000 per year. Economic impact, 500 million to 600 million dollars a year. A couple of things I'd point out about this slide. Uh, one is you can see the ramp up from when we opened in fiscal year 2005. You can also see that we've essentially plateaued. Uh, and what that means is we've, we've reached our maturity, we really can't do any more. If you look at our book of business and the hotel's book of business, uh, we've essentially reached maximum practical occupancy. So within the study we did, we essentially said that the do-nothing scenario looks like this. We'll hover around those 500 to 600,000 hotel room nights and we'll generate that 500 to 600 million dollars in economic impact and that may be enough. Uh, but that's where we're going to stay, and once in a while we'll pop up above those 600, and once in a while we'll pop down below the 500, uh, but we're just generally going to be right in there. Um, I mentioned uh, in terms of the first 10 years that we're able to project out for the next three years, and the reason we do that is our product is future time and space. What I sell to people uh, is uh, booking a conference in Boston uh, into the future, and they do that uh, a long time out. In fact, we've got contracts as far out as the year 2029. I can show you all of these numbers you see here, major events, 47, 44, 48. Those are events that have my signature on them, um, and those are con events that are going to be in Boston, and they'll hover in that range that I talked about. That's where they'll be. Uh, who are they? Bio, the largest bio industry conference in the world, will be back in Boston in 2012. It will never return again unless we build a bigger convention center with hotel space. Uh, light Fair, the largest architectural and lighting um, show in the world, uh, 25,000 people uh, is coming in 2013. Science teachers, and you'll see throughout this presentation a good deal of medical events that are coming here. So the next three years, uh, we have a great deal of certainty about what's going to happen. Um, so no matter how you want to look at this, whether well, it's qualitatively or quantitatively, um, we're in the top 10 since 2006. We're going to stay there for the foreseeable future. Uh, and some would say we're punching above our weight. Boston is the 22nd largest city in North America. The BCEC is the 26th largest convention center in North America. Um, yet we're in that 7, 8, 9 ranking in terms of market share. We've achieved gold standards for the BCEC and the Heinz Convention Center which is um, a, a qualitative evaluation or audit done um, within the industry. There's only 15 convention centers in the world that have the gold standard. Well, two of them are in Boston. Um, if you've been over to the South Boston waterfront, you see a visible display of the fact that we're the leader in technology. Uh, we were the first convention center to offer free Wi-Fi, for example. Five years ago, we were doing that. Um, and if you've attended an event, you know that we provide for spirit customer service and Boston has strong destination as well. Um, the events we're attracting are in the sweet spots of the Massachusetts economy. 35% of all those numbers I just told you are in medical and life sciences. 15% are in high tech. 13% are education conferences. So the meetings that are coming here are the meetings that we want here to support, 
support and sustain and grow the Massachusetts economy. And here's a look at some of them. Um, when I was looking at this chart earlier, uh, we didn't do this on purpose, but I'll take advantage of it anyway. Microsoft, Greenville, EMC can't come back to Boston. And EMC, as you know, is one of the leading companies in Massachusetts. They can't hold their events anymore in Boston. Um, so all of that means, if you're, in a, if you're a mature business in a mature industry, uh, one would say, well, you must be losing business. As part of the convention partnership exercise, we did a statistical analysis of our lost business. We keep very good records. And all of this is, we're a public agency, so all of this is available. Um, we lost 283 events uh, over the last four and a half years since the BC's, BC, BC Open. And we have a lot of categories why we lose business. Uh, sometimes we just lose. Uh, but 132 times we lost for reasons related to hotels and capacity at the BCEC. Um, when we were going through this process, like one of the members suggested that, well, Jim, you can't suggest that you would have landed all 132 of those. So we took a further haircut and said, you know what? When we get into the finals, our conversion rate is 45%. So we gave that number a further haircut and said that, okay, we would have landed 61 of them. I've actually checked this with some colleagues in private business, how they would have presented this, and they would have stopped at 132. Uh, but because we're in the public sector, we're held other things to a little higher standard. Um, so we cut that down to 61, and if you do the simple math, over four and a half years, we, um, we estimate that we lose 13 events per year because of lack of hotels or lack of size and space at the BCs. What does that mean? You saw in the video, 13 major events, um, 140 million in economic impact per year, and so forth. And Sometimes people say, well, all this lost business stuff, what's that all about? You know, show me who they are. Well, we did that. Uh, we provided a list of people. Here's three of them. Uh, we've given phone numbers to reporters and said, if you want to call them up and ask them, you know, would they have come to Boston if they had more hotel space? Uh, we provided them with a list, and there's, there's a couple of examples. Uh, because we're not just talking about people that walk by the building and said, gee, isn't that pretty? Let's put them down as a piece of lost business. Uh, what we're talking about is real business that would have come to Boston had we had the capacity to, to do it. Um, so the first 10 years in summary, capital investment financed 100% through industry sources. Largest building ever built in New England, public or private, was delivered on time and on budget. The taxes that are generated because we exist more than cover the operating expenses. The significant return on investment to the Commonwealth and other players within the industry, the hotels love us. We're losing business, which generates our growth potential. And we're hosting events in Massachusetts' key economies. So um, what do we do from here? That's the question that I said at the beginning that we're faced with. Uh, our vision is to become a top five destination, not rest in the top 10, uh, and to continue to generate significant economic, economic impact. Um, the components of that are a key strate a, a strategic development plan. You saw some of that. We need hotels in the waterfront. We have 1,700. Our competitive set averages 8,000 hotel rooms within walking distance of their convention center. Um, uh, another component of top five is changing and growing the world's perception of Boston and leveraging the kinds of events that we host here to do that. Uh, transit and mobility improvements. I need to be a part of this. People who come to cities for conventions need to be able to get around. Uh, enhancing Boston's hospitality culture. Uh, I won't go too deeply into this except to say that you just don't um, become a major player in the international meetings and convention business without dealing with the way people are treated uh, when they're touched within a city. And you have to talk about and manage that. Uh, and further supporting statewide economic development, call, commerce, and knowledge transfer. Um, you saw some of this. It involves expanding the convention center. It involves building hotels around the convention center. Uh, I can answer questions about what the key components would be if you care to get into that. Um, this gets into the hotel comparison issue and how many hotels we have within walking distance of the convention center versus the cities that we're competing with, especially those above us in the top, in the top uh, five. 
Um, this gets into how you pay for hotels, and this is a list of the 20 hotels that have been built in the United States since 1998 that are 700 rooms or more. It's only two or three more slides. Um, and what you see there, in the ones that are in red, um, were financed by government. The ones that are in blue were financed with significant public support. And the ones that are on the end, those two that were built in Times Square, um, that were approved right around the turn of the century, um, were built 100% private finance in, in Times Square. So the only two hotels in the United States that were built without some form of government in, um, involvement were in Times Square about 12 years ago. Um, don't we keep going here? Um, so how are we going to pay for it all? The six categories of funds that we've identified, and I'd be happy to get into this more. We have a convention center fund that has capacity in it. Um, we know that that exists. Uh, we know that there'll be incre additional incremental taxes generated by the activities that we mentioned already. If we do more business, we'll generate more tax revenues. Um, we also know that right now, um, the, the Commonwealth is using far more of the visitor and tourism industry revenues than was ever thought to be used. In fact, last fiscal year, 92% of the monies that are generated by the hotel taxes uh, go to the general fund. When those funds were set up back in the early part of the 90s and into uh, there's a couple of different pieces of legislation, a much higher portion of them was supposed to be in, reinvested in the third largest industry. That's stopped. What's happening now is all of that money's going over to the general fund. And what we're suggesting is, OK, during the downturn in the economy, that was fine to do that. But let's revisit that. It doesn't work for sustained hospitality, tourism, and convention to keep using that much money. Um, changing the hotel occupancy taxes, we know we might have to adjust those rates. Adjusting the convention center fund district right now, most of the money comes from Boston and Cambridge. Yet, a lot of the hotels outside of Boston and Cambridge benefit from the fact that we're doing all this business. And revenue sources other than traditional tourism, you can read that as casino revenue. Um, so what's the ROI if we do all of this? I, I'll let you kind of read that. We've done some estimates based on lost business and what we think we can do in terms of greater economic impact, greater tax benefits, more major events, hotel and nights, and so forth. Um, and this is the same slide you saw earlier and where we would be if we implemented the program that we talked about in terms of hotel room nights and economic impact, instead of in that five to 600, up in the eight to 900 range. Uh, jobs, I mentioned the importance of jobs uh, as a part of this program. Uh, the full expansion would generate about 7,000 construction jobs, temporary jobs, and uh, permanent jobs about 2,000 permanent jobs. And these jobs, by the way, once you work in a hotel, are not going to another state or to another country. These jobs stay right where they are. Uh, I want to wrap up uh, just by making the point that I, I, I started with on the, at the beginning uh, by saying that um, we should not get sucked in to measuring the success of conventions and meetings by just talking about how many hotel room nights were generated. That's important stuff, but it is about so much more than that. Uh, business events are held for a very specific reason that have nothing to do with it. The value of meetings has something different to whether you're an attendee, an employer, an exhibiting company who's trying to sell something, a destination like Boston, uh, or it has a, a greater comprehensive value to the economy. There's some dueling professors in this industry, one in Texas and one in England. Uh, this happens to be one in England who has done a great deal of work on this notion of tourism plus in terms of the core motives and that people have uh, meetings, they hold their business event, what the key outcomes are, innovation, increased productivity, sales, new skills and knowledge, and that the tourism impacts that we generate really are byproducts of what we do. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, so as a strategic foundation, we've done two things. We've completed two things in my mind. One is we're competing in key innovative knowledge-based regional industries. We do well bringing events in these industries that support Massachusetts economy, and we, we've showed you those numbers. We also compete for what I call opportunity events. By opportunity events, the best example I can use is the two uh, minority meetings conferences we had this summer. We talked about changing 
and developing the image of Boston nationally and across the globe. Um, people viewed Boston as not an attractive place for people of color to come and visit. Uh, we thought the solution to that, or a part of the solution, was not to just say you're wrong, but to actually host two events and bring 10, 15,000 people of color to Boston for a convention and actually show them that the city has changed. So these are what I view as opportunity events. Other kinds of opportunity events, sports conferences, cultural events, and so forth. In terms of the next steps as it relates to this strategic foundation, not only hosting these key industry events, but getting key participants to come, and then connecting uh, to the broader Massachusetts economy is part of what we need to develop going forward. Um, so that was probably a few minutes longer than you wanted, but that's, uh, that's the show. Thank, okay. you. Thank you very much, Jim. Mike? Can I stand for that? Uh, whichever you feel more Sure, that's fine. Um, Thank you, Alan. Thank you, David. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. A um, couple of preliminary comments. One is, I think Jim has done a fine job managing the convention center, um, and if there is an expansion, I hope he'll oversee it. Um, having said that, I think there are a large number of unanswered questions around this plan, and my purpose is to lay out some of those questions. Um, the first is, how are we going to pay for it? Jim laid out a series of possible sources, but I think any responsible approach to whether we have an expansion or not needs to have specific <coughs> revenue sources tied to the plan. Otherwise, it's just a dream and fine in and of itself if we didn't have any costs and competing costs, then sure, uh, this would be a good thing to do. But we need to have a specific revenue plan. Now, if we go back to the existing convention center, that was built heavily around tourist taxes. And I think that is a good thing. But if you look at the numbers around the uh, expansion, it will be very difficult to match that in terms of the cost of the expansion, a uh, billion dollars for the expansion, another whatever the number turns out, half a billion or whatever for the hotel, the public piece, um, it will be very difficult to identify tourism-based revenue sources to support the lion's share of the expansion. So in the end, you have two choices on the, rev on, on the cost, how to pay for it. One is new taxes. Fine, that's legitimate, including some tourism-related taxes, but probably also general taxes. And by the way, the casino gambling revenues are already spoken for, um, largely. Uh, secondly, and uh, you, your other source would be um, uh, existing revenues coming out of the state budget. So we have had a very difficult period, of course, of budget cuts over the last four years, and every program in state government has been cut. And even though we are in an alleged economic recovery, it's a very, very fragile recovery. And we are doing a study that will be out in a couple of months that will highlight the fact that we are entering a new period, even with an economic recovery, of seriously constrained revenue um, resources for state and local governments in our state. So this will have, paying for this will have uh, direct uh, consequences for other um, major and important investments that the state needs to un undertake. And that's really the second point I want to emphasize the question. What are the alternative opportunities for money uh, investments of this size? Um, as I said, there are a long, long list of programs that have been cut in this fiscal crisis. There are a long, long list of infrastructure and other capital needs competing for very limited dollars, and that will be the case for the next 10, 20 and years and beyond. If we're just measuring economic impact and, and beyond, there are two alternatives that I put on the table to show the complexity, if you will, and the seriousness of this debate around competing needs. One is public higher education in the state. We in the Commonwealth have never supported public higher education in the way that Connecticut or Illinois or other states have with their systems. 
But on top of that, in this fiscal crisis, we cut 15% of the funding for our public higher education in the state. From 09 to 12, about $150 million reduction. So the $150 million, which might be roughly the annual cost to pay for the expansion in the hotel, in round numbers, could be used to support public higher education in the state. And all of the studies have shown that we, as a state, in terms of our economic future, need to have a stronger public higher education system. The great private institutions like Harvard and MIT and so forth are a critical <coughs> part of the state's economy, but the great majority of those individuals leave the state. Not, to, not true for public higher education. And the other example, and there are many, many, is the MBTA. The MBTA is in a serious uh, crisis, fiscal crisis facing a budget deficit next year of $160 million, and it will grow from there. Huge backlog of maintenance needs. Can't afford to buy new cars, can't afford to maintain the current system. One million uh, people travel to T in and out um, each day to work. A critical, critical piece of our economic uh, competitiveness and economic future. And the T is heading over the cliff and desperately in need of, uh, of new revenues. Many savings have taken place. They can do more there, but absolutely needs new revenues. And so that's a direct compete com competitor for the money that would go, for example, to the convention center. Thirdly, what's the cost-benefit analysis? Jim and his team laid out some benefits. But you've got to look at the cost benefit, because everything has a price. So what, given the, the investments we make, how does that then compare to the return? Construction jobs are transferable. I mean, if we talking about maintaining the fee or our highway system, in which we are clearly facing a long-term shortfall, construction jobs can be uh, transferable there, and the unemployed construction workers will have the jobs that they otherwise would have at the convention center. If you look at permanent jobs, they're talking about 2,000 permanent jobs uh, created uh, with the expansion in the hotels. Considering the investment, that is not a lot of jobs. Now, Jim Argue has argued there are other benefits, but that's also true with things like the MBTA. In fact, that was on his list, that you need a decently running public transit system in order to support the expansion, and you can't spend the same dollar twice. So the whole question of the cost-benefit uh, is critical. And finally, um, the, the issue of the hotel. Jim showed you uh, an overhead on the um, fact that we are way to the bottom in terms of hotels within the half-mile walking so we have about 1,700, and others have several thousand, or 15. If you add the headquarter hotel in this proposal, that might bring us up to 3,000. And I know there's efforts to try to expand beyond that. But at 3,000, we've gone from 15th on the list to 13th on the list. So the issue that they identify, the those who say, well, we won't come back, or come back as frequently as whatever, around hotel development, the exhibition uh, space is a different matter, but around hotel development, even if we do what this proposal says, we are way down on the list of competitors in terms of hotels. So the question is, and I don't have an answer, but I think it's a question that has not been answered, is even if we build these hotels, and Jim has said they absolutely must, we have to have additional hotel rooms in order to support it, expansion. Even if we build these hotel rooms, will they come? Well, some, of course. I mean, there's no question. Some additional conventions will come. But how many? And will it justify the investment? So in the end, there are a large number of unanswered questions, not about the desire of having the expansion per se, but about how it's going to be paid for, what are the, what's the opportunity cost, what are the competing uses of those What's the cost-benefit analysis? And will, in fact, the investment around the hotels 
create the additional business that Jim and his team uh, have laid out. Thank you. study that I've been running from for about 20 years. Um, it's a study that was done by a consultant out of Florida that came up, and I'm not sure what he was thinking, but uh, on the hotel rooms, he projected about a 200% increase would be generated. There was no way that was ever going to happen. We saw it early and said no. That's one data point within the projections. Uh, the other things that they projected was the number of people that would visit, the number of uh, events that were being held, the occupancy of the convention center. A number of other metrics were projected within that report, and we hit or exceeded all of that. On this one number of hotel room nights, um, uh, we didn't, and there was no way we were ever going to do it, so we created a new baseline in 2003. Um, it is a data point and something that we have absorbed and need to recognize, but I would say that there isn't a business in America that is looking at a sales projection from 15 years ago as a way to try to help them understand what they do today. Um, I just don't think anyone's doing that, and why should we do that? If you want to take an intellectually honest look at the data I've presented, which, by the way, is based on seven years of history, not projections of how a city's going to do in an industry that it's not in yet. We have seven years of history that we can rely on. You can look at the data that we've put forward and say, is this a good or bad business decision? I think it's very superficial to just say, Someone got it wrong 15 years ago. Let's get out of the business. Okay, let me ask you the second uh, skeptic's question. Uh, you showed us a slide on the rapid growth of the national yeah. uh, convention center industry in the 1990s. From 2000 to 2010, on the other hand, the number of attendees in conventions declined by roughly a third. Uh, over a 10 year period, business, the industry. reason to believe that uh, this is that there's really going to be substantial growth and we have to take the growth from other cities in order to get it. Well, I guess I'd, I'd first by start by debating the premise of your question about some decline of the third. Um, I'll say two things because... Well, only, let me just uh, okay. say what the source is. There was one source, which has gone out of existence now, <coughs> which was the only source to track this okay. on a national basis. Uh, they tracked it regularly, and mm -hmm. the convention center industry relied on it. Before they went out of business, which they've done within the last year, mm -hmm. uh, they reported that uh, attendance at conventions and trade shows nationally dropped uh, from roughly 126 million to 86 million from 19 from 2000 to 2010. Okay. Um, so a couple of things have happened. One is that that dramatic growth that we talked about. I mean, I'd, I'd still debate some of those numbers, but I want to, I want to get to the core of the question. Yeah. Um, I want to get to the core of the question. Yeah. Two things happened in uh, the 80s into the 90s and even the early part of uh, this century. Uh, and that's, as I said, that cities like Boston got in and it was a space race. So I would say and agree with people that are critics that uh, there is an abundance of supply 
the supply exceeds demand right now in America. I, I would say that's a given. Um, to me, in any industry that you have that situation, all that means is there's going to be winners and losers, and you need to assess your ability, your product, and your ability to compete. I think we've shown numbers uh, in real performance over the past seven years that the 22nd largest city in North America competing with the seventh leading market share, uh, that we are among the winners. If you look at all of the hundreds of cities in North America that are competing within this $900 billion industry, which is still a big industry regardless of whether attendance has gone down and whether we debate that number, um, it's a $900 billion industry, um, and we're competing very well in it. 50, 25 of 25 cities have 53 percent of the market share in this business. And I'm submitting that we're sitting in one of them that can compete very effectively. And do I think there's some cities that are overbuilt? Sure there are. Should will some close their doors or repurpose some of their space? They should. But I don't think Boston's one of them. Okay, let's open it up. Yes. I didn't actually come as either a skeptic or a promoter. Um, but I, I do seek a little bit of, of guidance here. Um, if I understood your numbers, they were saying that you wanted to go from the five or 600 zone to the eight or 900 zone. The expenses, I understood it, that got you into the five or 600 zone was about 850 million. And the expense that would get you into the eight or 900 zone, a 50% increase, was two billion. And I guess my question is, could, can you possibly repeat, given those, you know, the, the balance between those, how could you repeat the experience that you had the first time, which is that you were able to finance the whole effort from what I think you identified as either as incremental imposition on a narrow industry. If the costs grow a, a double and the, and the base only grows 50%, isn't Mike right that essentially the other half of that two billion is going to have to come from places that aren't dedicated to increment to this incremental business. Yeah, I think there's probably a couple of questions embedded within that. Um, first, let's talk about the two billion. Um, if you break that down, given the stage with, that we're at, um, right away I'd say that 25 percent is what I think of as contingency on top of contingency. Um, we put a half a billion dollars. And just because we don't know the scope of this project. And I'll give you an example of what happens in public construction projects. When we built the BCEC, um, not included in the original scope was $30 million worth of local street improvements I was asked to make. I don't know what the scope of this is going to look like. If you look at hard construction estimates that we've done based on a hypothetical program with a reasonable contingency, it's about a billion and a half. So there's a huge contingency in there because we just don't know what it's going to be. The second thing I'd say is that uh, one of the components of that is a $700 million hotel development, which we expect will have uh, a substantial private um, level of participation. And the numbers we ran, they could be four or $500 million. So uh, a big portion of that would come uh, from a private development team, which is the same way we did the Western Hotel, private development with some level of government intervention to get it over. Did I hit everything? I think well, probably. I think, I think I hear you saying that the incremental public investment is maybe more like 250 million for the hotel, not 700, and that the incremental investment for the for the convention center piece of it might not be the full billion. Well, I don't or? know. I mean, I, I, again, I don't. People get burned in public sector jobs when they make estimates and then years later someone says, you know, build one and a half times what we, you said at the beginning and then, you know, uh, defend the fact that the price went up, okay? So we've gone high early and I'd rather defend down than defend up. Now, if someone says to me, Jim, uh, which many people in that community, if you know the district, there's no open space in that part of South Boston at all. And people are already trying to leverage this opportunity to say, you know what, we think we could use some more open space down here. If I'm asked as part of the mitigation or part of this program to build large amounts of open space, then that's going to be in there and people are going to ask me why I went over budget. So we put that money in now 
just as placeholders uh, in the event that that thing begins to happen. So, so I don't know, and I don't want to. I don't want to change the number because I'm not going to walk out and tell the globe <coughs> tomorrow it's only a billion and a half. Um, but what we've done is we've put that large contingency in for those reasons. This point of clarification: yeah. so two billion dollar estimate, an estimate of public costs. Or no, this that includes private uh, equity in a hotel development. I mean, I've used based sitting on the partnership over that period and then um, discounting the private investment. The number I used uh, used is based on information Jim's presented is about one and a half billion of public costs. And I think your question is right at the mark. I mean, we uh, shaped my <coughs> comments uh, in a very, I think, cogent way, suggesting exactly the reality that you're talking about it huge additional investment that will not be possible to be funded by just incremental tourist taxes and therefore the opportunity cost uh, question and the overall cost is much more germane than it was in the initial convention center. Uh, Susan, could you go to the microphone so sure. Alan, also if you could ask people to identify themselves. Yes. This is Sorry, my name is Peter Munkenbeck. Oh. Hi, I'm Susan Feinstein, and I'm Professor of Urban Planning at the PSD. Uh, I'm going to cite this professor from Texas to whom you referred in passing, uh, but didn't show his numbers. And one of the things he points out, or even your chart of the 90s points out, is that as the number of convention attendees grew, the amount of space grew commensurately, which meant that divided out, no place is going to benefit that much from the increase in attendance. Uh, but also, once you have this huge surplus of space, it means that in order to get a convention to come, you have to, in some way, bribe them. And so what we've seen now throughout the country is that cities, which have all expanded their convention centers, I mean, Boston is not unique, uh, have been giving enormous subsidies to uh, convention uh, in order to come there, which means that the economic impacts have to be netted out uh, and the revenue impacts from the amount that um, uh, we're projecting. And also, of course, the economic impact numbers are just you know, out of blue sky because we have no way of knowing how much these people actually do spend. And so uh, we attribute some proportion of the amount of money spent in apartment stores and restaurants and so forth uh, to the impact of uh, conventioneers, uh, but we don't really have any good data at all to show how much genuine economic impact came from people coming to a convention as opposed to people just coming on the freedom track. I think we have about three questions. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. The rest of the panelists do. Um, so let me, if I, I won't remember all of them, but I'll start with the economic impact because we actually spend a lot of time on this, as do um, some others. Uh, one is that um, we do have data. Uh, we do a great deal of uh, intercept surveys. I mentioned that we're, uh, we pride ourselves on being a high-tech facility. We're actually doing them on iPads now where people come in and they are very willing. We have thousands of responses to this. We ask, ask them how much they spend in restaurants, how much they spend uh, shopping, and how much uh, they spend in um, uh, transportation and so forth. So we have a, a, a lot of data on that. Um, we went to a uh, independent uh, economic forecaster and, and someone who analyzes these kinds of things, and they looked at it. I guess, I guess what I'd say, and I understand that the further you get out from actual sort of costs and, and, and revenues, you know, the fuzzier things get. I understand that. Um, but I would say is the, the opposite of that is thinking that everyone sort of takes the money that they make and puts it under their pillow. And, and I don't think that's what happens either. Um, so the question is to sort of the degree to which um, people have made reasonable assumptions. The great thing about being an economics major is that you figured out pretty early that you sort of make 17 assumptions, plug them into a formula, and declare it science, right? Um, you know, that's what it is. It's, 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 um, it's assumption-based, but there's some reality to it. Uh, in terms of, uh, what was the part of the, the convention. What is it? The, the intensity of competition for the 
Oh, yes. You know, yeah. you, know, right. you know, this is, when, when I said at the beginning that we're processing what I think of as a business decision through sort of government and public policy filters and models, um, that, that's an example. I don't think um, there's, there's sort of anyone who would walk into Microsoft and say, you know what, there's too many people making computers now. Let's not compete anymore. Um, sure, it's a it's a it's a uh, sharp elbows, tough environment out there. But we're demonstrating that we're competing in it. And yes, there's more convention space than there should be. And unless we take advantage of Mike's training in in, in uh, sort of Soviet economy, I'm not sure what you do about it. Unless someone's going to sit in Washington and say, "You can have one, and you can't have one, and you can't have one." Why should Boston just retreat and say, "You know what"? We're not going to be a, a big player in this or any other industry. We don't want to compete. You know, we're, we're just going to retreat and, and, and stand back because you know Cleveland has one now and, and St. Petersburg has one now. I just don't think that that's right-minded thing. Mike, I would just add a couple of things. One is we don't really know how many conventions are going to come here if we expand. And I think the analysis of that is really quite thin and uncertain. Uh, and secondly, there hasn't been any real cost-benefit analysis, as I mentioned. So yes, there are slides, and this is sort of classic with any kind of proposed expansion or public development. Here are all the benefits. But you've got to look at the cost side, and then you analyze, of course, the cost versus the benefits. And that hasn't been done. And I think if that were done, it would show, even with um, uncertain estimates of which conventions, of how many conventions would come, that this is a questionable economic investment given the alternative uses of scarce public talents. Other questions? Uh, and you met Carl McLaurin. Uh, Jim, you mentioned that there was a surplus that the Convention Center Authority gives back to the Commonwealth. Can you tell us a little bit about what that fund? Well, what's the source? What's the source? Of that? Yeah, the uh, convention center fund was set up in 1997. It's largely driven by hotel taxes, mostly collected in Boston and Cambridge. It's an increment of the hotel tax. There's also some revenues that come in from things like trolley tours, duck tours, um, uh, some other things in there. All hospitality tours and industry revenues. Um, it was, and I think most people would agree. Um, it was a very well created funding mechanism for what we attempted to do. And the uses of it are to pay the debt service on the building we built, the end of one in Springfield, as well as pay our operating costs going forward. Um, the fund has performed beyond anyone's expectations to the point that um, most significantly in 2009, uh, the state drew $65 million to help um, to help balance the state's operating budget. So, um, so the numbers that we contributed to generating um, uh, have really been in surplus. I don't like to say that because the state will take more of it. Um, but you know, a, a larger point, and, and I know that Mike sort of keep bringing it up, and um, I kind of view it somewhat as a false choice. I mean, it's like going home and putting sort of $10,000 on the table and say, what should we do with it? I mean, the notion that we should sort of decide to make a decision within the third largest, with, about investing in our third largest industry, uh, because we haven't had the political coverage to deal with the transportation underfunding that's gone on, we haven't had the coverage to raise the gas tax since 1991. So because we haven't been able to do that, let's not talk about building a bigger convention center. Let's tell Bio and EMC and Microsoft and all of these other key industries we don't want you to come to Boston. Um, I, I just think that's a false choice. I don't think that that's the way that the decisions get made. Um, it's interesting to say it that way, um, but it's really not the way that things get, decisions get made. And I just add, I agree with Jim on the underfunding of transportation. It's a critical issue. But the answer, I think the rebuttal of what Jim is saying is, okay, but then let's put on the table a funding source, I mean a real plan, the convention center and debate that as part of the expansion. 
so we know what the funding is going to be. Yeah, we don't have a, a long, uh, surplus of political will uh, on a lot of issues, so uh, we know that. But uh, uh, we also know, in the end, we have scarce resources, no matter how much we uh, put additional tax, how much, much in a way of additional taxes are adopted. Can I, I show, actually, can I answer that question just a little bit? I'm sorry? Let me just sharpen that question just a little bit. It's the same question. Okay. Which is to say, um, is it possible for your plan to work with a series of incremental taxes or taxes that rely upon incremental activity within the sector broadly stated that you're serving? Um, so um, I'll answer that question, but I want to tell you what the group did and did not do. We took six potential funding sources, for example, the Convention Center Fund as it exists today, uh, and we had an independent financial analysis done of what's the capacity of that. We have a range, you make assumptions about interest rate, you know all of that. So we have a range of what that would do. We have a range of what incremental new taxes would be created if we did um, uh, this expansion that we're talking about. We know what 1% of the hotel tax is worth in Boston and Cambridge and how much that would generate. As importantly, and I want to sort of restate this point, back in 1991 when a lot of these taxes were created, there were commitments made to the hospitality and tourism industry and to the hotel community that we're going to create these taxes and we're going to take a big percentage of them and use them for the general fund. We're going to take a big percentage of them and use it for reinvestment in your industry. Well, that didn't happen. 92% of that money is gone now into the general fund. It would go a long way towards being able to not only support the growth of the convention center that we're talking about and continue to generate additional economic impact if we just went back to a portion, a portion of what was promised when those, that legislation was first, was first passed. Um, so if you cobble together, and we've got ranges of how much, if you put all of those together, you can create a financing plan that is in the range that's needed to support the debt service that we're, that we're talking about. And why would you do that? Because, as I said, this is the third largest industry in Massachusetts, and it is something that I don't think you stop. I don't think a long-term strategy is to just sort of take all the money that you can get out of it and just let it, even for the tea or education or something else, because it's not sustaining to not reinvest. And I agree, by the way, I want to just say, because we haven't done it, and, and, the, and the group that, uh, that was on the commission, it was a bunch of volunteers, they didn't want to put forward a specific proposal that says, let's raise the hotel tax. And I do think we're at the point now where it's incumbent upon us to produce a very specific plan, and I think one of the reasons why might would be uncomfortable because it's not specific. And I think we do have an obligation to say, look, okay, here's the six pieces that would add up to what, what um, would pay for this thing. What do you think? And, and would it then be, uh, sorry. No, we have, we have a hand. I just wondered the number of hotels, you say 1,700 in the yeah. waterfront. Um, that's a fairly new frontier. What if you add in Boston downtown and Perhaps if you know even Cambridge. Yeah, Boston has about 20,000 hotels. Greater Boston has about 30,000, um, which in aggregate is, well, it used to be enough. It's not enough anymore because Boston and Cambridge hotel occupancy is probably going to set a new record next year. And it's really at maximum practical occupancy, so get ready for your hotel rates to go up. Um, so there's generally been enough um, rooms for us to bus people all over the city which creates a couple of problems for us. One, of course, is the attendee inconvenience. If you go to a conference in Boston, you want to run back to your hotel, you've got to take the bus to the back way to get there. And the other is what we said during the presentation. It can cost you a half a million, a million bucks of expense in Boston that you don't have in these other cities that, that um, people can walk to their hotels. I want to address this issue of the capacity down there and what we've put forward. Um, there's 1,700 rooms down there now. What we are saying is today we need 4,000 rooms, and to make this expansion work, we need six to 8,000 hotel rooms in the South Boston Marshall. Mike said it, but I want to underscore it. I'm on the record as saying that absent a hotel strategy that is real, that will actually produce hotel rooms, don't expand the convention center because we can't fill it without additional hotel rooms. So that has to be a priority. What we've said is that the two immediate steps, this isn't the end of it, 
the two immediate steps are the 1,000 to 12 room, 100 room um, convention hotel, along with the strategy to encourage the development of mid-price limited service hotels because we've got zero of those. There's no hotel uh, down there where you can get a decent rate. They're all in that sort of four and five star rate. We need to encourage the development of somewhere in the order of a thousand of those. And then if you look at the development plans down there, all of the, you know them, Tom, Bam uh, Pier and, and, and uh, all of the others, uh, they all have hotels with them. And over time, we're just going to have to measure whether or not those developers are going to do it, and I'll say it out loud, or whether or not government intervention in getting them over the finish line is needed to stimulate those hotels into getting built. We do it in every form of development. We give tax deals, we do all kinds of things for hotel development, for residential development. Uh, this is nothing new in the development world for government to play some role in getting those things over the finish line. Let me ask you, uh, give a more, a more general question. Um, I'm not sure how to think about convention centers. You can help me. Uh, if we think of them as a business, um, then we look at the existing convention center, we say we have an $850 million capital investment which the government is going to pay the entire cost of. No, no return on that. And then it requires about a $20 million a year annual subsidy uh, to keep it going. And so that's a business we're going to now try to expand. Uh, and we'll make further investments where we get no return on capital and we require operating subsidies. Uh, now, I realize there are spin-off effects. The hotels make some money and, and, and so on and so forth. But as one thinks about it as a business, it's hard to think of any other industry um, like that. And if you think about public services, we think about them primarily in terms of serving residents of the state. So in, in high, higher education, for example, we have different tuition rates for in-state and out-of-state attendees at the universities. Why is the convention center business, a unique business, that government should subsidize to this degree? Um, that's a good question. It really is that the private sector won't do it. The numbers don't pencil out enough for private industry to come and say that, um, I'm going to generate economic activity that doesn't flow to my bottom line outside of my four walls, so I'll make this investment and lose money while hotels and restaurants everyone else makes it. I mean, that's just the model um, uh, for convention centers. Um, now, there's other models around the world in which the convention centers um, can make a profit, but they, in places where the labor rates are a lot different and, and so forth. Um, uh, China, for example, the convention center growth is unparalleled in terms of what's being built in China. Um, and I will make a point if you do want to continue your research on this, Alan. Yes, indeed. Um, if you read why they're building convention centers in China, nothing to do with the metrics we're talking about. They don't care about hotel room nights. They don't care how much people go shopping. They don't care about transportation. They want meetings and conventions in core economic development industries to come and meet there because they view it as a broader economic development platform. If you look at Dubai, you look at all of the emerging uh, economies, this is why they're building and expanding convention centers. And we had that mindset at one time. We had the mindset of the role of convention centers in the broader economy of the region. And somehow it shifted to this notion that they don't make money within the four walls, they don't generate enough hotel room nights, or this incremental value isn't enough. So we're just going to be dismissive now of these, of these um, of broader economic benefits. I went to a, a, a conference, and there was a, a fellow, there was another UK fellow, maybe I'm listening to too many guys. Um, but anyway, one of his points was on, on something like this, that the, um, the uh, mature economies need to start thinking like emerging economies, and this is, I think, one of them. Okay, we had one final question before we break. Yes. Jim, I, you know, I keep giving you a hard time about the very room night thing that you're talking about. And, and I guess my question then is, you know, if it's not room nights, then what are the metrics? I mean, I think you can understand why there are those of us who are very concerned about putting this amount of money into something where there's no metrics for what the returns are. And, you know, when during the, the partnership, you had the mass, little mass 
Insight Study. And when they come back saying things like, well, what about the number of people who come to conventions who buy second homes here? You know, I say, oh, that doesn't make me feel real good about this. You know, what should the metrics be? Um, two things. It's not that we haven't put out any metrics. We have put out metrics, shall we? Within That's all right. of the, within all of the traditional tourism industry metrics. We've been very specific about what we think will be the number of hotel room nights, economic impact, all of the traditional metrics. We've said if we build these things, and further, and you know this, we've broken it down into components and said if we just build a hotel, these are the tourism metrics that you salivate out of. If you just build a exhibit space, these are the tourism metrics. Here they are. Here's what we'll get. And here's the cost. So there's cost. There's, there's tourism metrics that you look for. What we haven't done is what Mike said, which is to identify specifically within those six financing options, specifically how much do I want to get out of each one of those. I admit that we haven't done that yet, but it's a work in progress and, and we need to do it. The other thing I'll, I'll say to you, and I didn't like the fact that Bill said that that was a dumb metric to put out there. The issue that Charlie's talking about is that I've put forward this notion that meetings are about business and knowledge transfer. I sit here saying that I don't know how to measure knowledge transfer. I sit here saying that I can't because I don't have data that says that when a convention, when an exhibitor came to town and says, and we have data that supports this, exhibitor came to town and said, I exhibited at this show primarily because I wanted to make sales. And we have data that says, as an attendee, I came to this show primarily because I want to buy something. I want to look and see what exists in my marketplace. What I don't have is any of that transaction data. I know that commerce takes place because that's why the meeting gets set up in the first place. I know that at education conferences that we all go to, that there's knowledge transfer that takes place. I can't measure that. What I'm offering is the fact that I know that it's powerful and I know that it exists. Mike, do you want to have a final comment? All right, well, I think that uh, what we can all agree is that Jim Rooney is a great public servant and a great representative of the Convention Authority. We, don't, we have not reached an agreement on whether it's a good idea to go forward with this billion and a half dollars of public investment, but a good case has been made for it and some good criticisms as well, and that's about as far as we can take a rapport for this evening. Thank you both very much. For your